In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We consecrate this mission to the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, our Mother of Sorrows. We make this in honor of St. John Vianney, and under the patronage of St. Vincent Ferrer, St. Anthony of Padua. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. <clears throat> Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt be the Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, Grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There was once a young boy in the New England area uh, to protect his identity. We'll call him Philip. Well, Philip wasn't too popular of a boy. He was one who really never fit in. Uh, he wasn't good at sports. He was the last one to be picked for teams. He was socially awkward. And although he had a good heart, he was someone who was often forgotten and not included by those around him. Now, I'm sure that kind of leaving out of others wouldn't happen here, but there's a public school, so I just want to set the picture here, okay? No one would even sit with this boy at lunch. He had to take his lunches by himself. Well, there was another classmate of his. Uh, we'll call him Steve. And Steve was more popular. He was sometimes invited by the really popular boys to be on their team, to hang out with them. Well, Steve liked the fact that he was in with the popular crowd, at least partially, and uh, he really kind of valued this status that he was starting to achieve here. Well, one day Steve uh, kind of felt bad for Philip, and he invited him to be on the team. You know, Well, to Steve's embarrassment, Philip, the unpopular boy, ecstatically shouted, yes, I'd love to, to the embarrassment of Steve. Uh, but Steve didn't do much more beyond that for Philip. The big day came for Steve when the really popular boys finally asked him to sit at their table in the cafeteria. Well, every day as he would go and sit with his popular friends, Steve would pass by Philip, who was sitting by himself. One day... While he was taking his tray over to the popular table, he stopped because he heard a voice inside him. It wasn't a voice outside, but he heard clearly someone say, sit with him. Sit with him. Well, he knew for the first time in his life for certain that God was talking to him. Well, this is a big moment in Steve's life, huh? What was he going to do? He knew who the he was referring to. But what was Steve going to do? Well, this is what he did. He just walked past Philip. He sat with the popular boys. Well, the next day, as he was going to lunch, same thing happened. He heard very clearly inside him, sit with him. And again, Steve just walked by. It happened every day. It got to where Steve didn't even want to go to lunch. In fact, what he started to do, he started to go to study hall instead of going to lunch because he didn't want to hear the voice inside saying, sit with him. He was so attached to his status with the other boys that he didn't want to risk that by sitting with the unpopular, uncool Philip. Well, a couple of years went by and the boys were finally finishing middle school. One day Philip had a very humiliating experience on the bus. He's getting beat up and Steve knew he should stand up and try and defend him. But he was outnumbered. So he sat down. He didn't do anything. He told his father about that incident that night. And his father told him, you should have fought to defend Philip. Steve explained, yeah, but there were too many. I was outnumbered. I would have gotten beat up. And his father rightfully explained to him, that would have hurt less 
and the remorse of your conscience for not doing the right thing. Well, something else happened that night. That night, Philip died. He left a note behind in which he said, my life has been a living hell. But that note was just addressed to anyone. It wasn't addressed to anyone in particular. What the principal of that school did is he put in every boy's name of that school and everyone in his class. He filled in their name as though it were addressed personally to each one of them. When Steve got his note, he opened it up and he read, Dear Steve, my life's been a living hell. He went on to say other things, talked about how am I going to deal with high school. I don't have any friends. And it ended with, and no one would even sit with me at lunch. No one would sit with him at lunch. Steve was called to something higher. But he neglected. He neglected. Because of some attachment. He was called to be Christ-like. He was called to be ultimately a saver. A savior to save this person's life. But he neglected. He was living for something else. He didn't want to let go of that popularity. That status that he was shooting for. He didn't want to let go of that. Well, we need to ask each one of ourselves, we need to ask, what are we living for? What are we living for? What is important in our lives? According to St. Paul, no man on earth can comprehend the infinite blessings that God has ready for those who love him. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man to desire what God has prepared for those who love him. Think of that. It hasn't even entered into people's hearts to desire what God has prepared in heaven, if we get there. He also says that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to come. St. Bernard says that in heaven, there is nothing which you would not desire, and there's everything that you would desire. In this life, there are many troubles. We can't escape them. We have fears, we have temptations, doubts of conscience, uncertainty of salvation, a lot of troubles in this life. But if we make it to heaven, we will have no more sorrows, no more, all gone. No sorrows, no sickness, no fears, no anxiety, no tiredness, no poverty, no inconveniences, no unstable changes of bitter cold, bitter heat. So, if we want to get to paradise, we do have to start moving there. We have to start moving in that direction. Now, how many souls out there seem to have hit a spiritual wall? Kind of a plateau in the spiritual life where you're not going up anymore. Some people practice their devotions, but things have just stopped. Why aren't they growing in charity? Well, St. Thomas says that every act of charity merits an increase of charity. However, this increase doesn't always come at once, but only when we strive generously for it. As Father Garigou Lagrange explains in The Three Ages of the Interior Life, imperfect acts of charity, although meritorious, do not at once obtain the increase of grace which they merit. Not right away. A good act might be done that is far below the virtue, far below the level of charity that someone is capable of. On the natural order, you might think of lifting weights, right? If you're capable of bench pressing your weight and you just lift half your weight, you're not going to grow in your muscle power, are you? It's no different in the spiritual life. The increase in charity from the merits of those acts that we do that are below what we're capable of is not going to come only until we make generous acts of charity that exceed our level of charity, exceed what we're capable of right now, exceed what we're doing right now. So St. Thomas says the increase of charity comes only when we strive generously for it. So if we're not growing in charity, we must not be striving for it generously. 
there's either something wrong in the person who's not being generous with God, or there's some sin or attachment that the soul is not letting go of. And that's what's keeping him stuck. St. John of the Cross points out, it doesn't matter if a bird is tied with a heavy rope or a thread. If it's tied, it can't fly. That's us in the spiritual life. We need to be generous. We need to be generous. You all have been given an awful lot. Think about what you have here. Think about the possibilities here. You've been given an awful lot compared to people in the rest of the state, the rest of the country, the rest of the continent. The rest of the world, you've been given an awful lot. Think about what our Lord says. To those whom more has been given, more will be required. See, God isn't just interested in saving your souls. He wants you to pray a lot of people into heaven. But you need to be sanctified. You need to be holy to do that. So to become more generous, to become holy... We can practice mental prayer. We can ask Our Lady. We can do a whole host of things. Especially, we can use the Holy Rosary. And Father Gregor Lagrange especially recommends making generous acts of love on Fridays. The day that our Lord made that first really significant generous act of love for us. So, there's a number of things we can do. We'll get to some particulars later. But keep this in mind. Our Lord said himself, Whomsoever much is given, much shall be required. And to whom they have been committed much, of him they will demand the more. God demands more than what we're given him. God demands more. You know, when um, uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta started the Missionaries of Charity, it's not very known that she actually had a few uh, locutions and apparitions of Our Lady. Uh, some of the saints appeared to her and Our Lord. She kept this very well hidden, and um, she was very apprehensive about taking on this difficult task of founding this order. And at one point, Our Lord told her, he appeared to her and he said, quote, Are you afraid to take one more step for your spouse? For me... For souls? Is your generosity grown cold? Am I a second to you? You did not die for souls. That's why you don't care what happens to them. This is God telling Mother Teresa. You didn't die for souls. That's why you don't care what happens to them. Your heart was never drowned in sorrow, as was my mother's. We both gave our all for souls. And you? Close quote. If we are not being generous, we will not be holy. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past, how far we think we've come. If we're not being generous, we're not going to be holy. That's just as simple as that. Well, how do we become holy? How do we know if we belong to Jesus Christ or not? The scriptures make it very clear. How to know whether we belong to Christ? It says, Galatians 5.24, quote, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the vices and the concupiscences, close quote. That's how we know if we belong to Christ. Have we crucified our flesh with the vices and the concupiscence? According to the word of God, they that are Christ's have crucified their flesh with the vices, not only the vices, but the concupiscences as well, the inclinations. If these are still there, We're not fully Christ, according to the word of God, are we? We have to be holy. That's so important. It only matters how we die. That's the most important thing. Because that's the state that we're going to be locked in when we die. As a man lives, so he dies. As the tree falls, that's where it will lay. As we're living now, that's how we're going to die. That's it. If we're not ready now, when will we be? When are we going to be ready? When will we at last will to break the habits of sin we formed? Confession is a great, great grace. 
Now, it shouldn't become a revolving door, huh? We need to break from these habits of sin. Father Biderman relates of a young man who was in the habit of relapsing into a sin of impurity. Well, at the hour of death, he confessed his sins with many tears, and he died. His confessor was there. He confessed his sins with many tears, and then he died, leaving strong grounds to hope for salvation. On the following day, his confessor, while saying Mass, felt someone pulling at his chasuble. He turned around and he saw this dark cloud. There were flames coming out of it. And he recognized the voice of the boy who had died the night before. He explained that it was the soul of the young man who had gone to confession the night before. And he was damned. He explained that although he had been absolved from his sins, he was again tempted because he had a habit of impurity. He was again tempted to sin of thought. He yielded to it and he was damned. Habits of sin, we have to break from them. Here, this young man had a priest the night he died, just before he died. He went to confession with many tears. But the habits of sin had locked him in. He wasn't ready to give it all up when the temptation came along next. Now that was the end of someone who had contracted a bad habit of sin. Our Lord himself says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to his works. And we may say, come on, Father. We're traditional Roman Catholics. What sins could keep us from heaven? We're doing fine. Well, let's look at a few things. There are probably some people here that think they're holy. I've got news for you. If you think that, you're not holy. If you think you're holy, I'm telling you, you're not. I know there are people here that think they're holy, and I don't, I mean, I'm a, this is, that's got to be the case. But if you're not pursuing Christ fully with all your heart, we are just not holy. Remember, self-righteousness is one of the worst sins. The devil's never failed in a sin of impurity. The devil never has. But he has sinned by self-righteousness. That's the sin that makes us most like the devil. Unto whomsoever much is given, much shall be required. We may have the traditional Latin Mass every day. Thanks be to God. Unto whom much is given, much shall be required. Remember that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the vices and the concupiscences. Now, we need to be mortified. This is very important. We need to be mortified. The church is the spouse of Christ. Okay? The church is the, is the, is the spouse of Christ, the bride of Christ, and the bridegroom is a crucified bridegroom. He's the bridegroom of the church. Blessed Baptist Varani said that the crucified bridegroom desires a crucified spouse. We need to crucify our vices. St. Alphonsus explains that one needs to lead a life of continual mortification and self-denial. He bases this in Scripture. He points out where St. Paul says that Christians are always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.10 Always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus. That's quite important. Can we say that we're always bearing about the mortification of Christ in our bodies? Are we relaxing? Are we making good use of the sacrament of penance? Good use of the sacrament of penance. If there's anyone here who has concealed a sin in the confessional, now is the time to be freed from that bondage of sacrilege. Come to confession God's mercy is waiting there. 
God's mercy is waiting there. You're not going to shock the priest. You've, you've had priests that have heard confessions in, in different parts of the country. I'd be willing to bet that every priest has heard sins against every commandment confessed in the confessional. I'll be willing to bet that. You're not going to shock a priest. Okay. If you've got a sin on your soul and you've been carrying it around, get it off your chest now before it's too late. There was a sister in Florence. When she was 18 years old, um, she committed a mental sin of impurity. Mental sin. Nothing external. Mental sin of impurity. No one ever saw it outside our Lord. She was so embarrassed, she didn't confess it. And uh, her conscience started tearing her apart. So she started, she started praying more. She said, well, I'll just pray more. I'll do some fasting. I'll do some mortifications to try and ease her conscience. Well, the sisters at the school where she went saw how much she was praying and her fasting and stuff. They invited her to join the order. They said, you got, maybe you've got a vocation, you know. So she joined. And all this time, she never confessed the sin. But she maintained a very mortified life, very hard life, very uh, penitential, outwardly penitential life. And so eventually she kind of was chosen for different important tasks. Well, finally, she was elected as reverend mother of this convent. It's a poor Claire convent in Florence, Italy. Well, think of how many times she had the opportunity to confess that. She was so ashamed. And at this point, she had just gone so far that she held on to it. She passed away. And the the sisters were praying for her. And they were kind of rejoicing, you know, that the fact that this holy sister had, had passed away is now one of their own is in heaven here, you know. They were still praying for her soul, of course, as pious sisters were, were doing. But three days after she died, she appeared to one of the sisters And she said, she said, you can stop praying for me because I'm damned. I'm damned. She explained that she committed a mental sin of impurity at age 18 and she never confessed it out of embarrassment. So she told the sisters, you can stop praying for me. You're not going to shock the priest. Get those sins off your chest. Come to God's mercy. Come to confession. We have to keep Sundays holy. St. Alphonsus explains in his uh, little practicum for confessors, he says, instruct the penitent also in the fact that it is sinful to work for a long time, even when the work is done not for pay, but solely for enjoyment. On Sunday, this is talking about Sunday work. You must correct the wrong notion that it is always permissible to work on holy days if you are not working for a wage. Close quote. That's from the moral doctor of the church, St. Alphonsus. That's his job in the church is to present the moral theology chosen by the bride of Christ, by all the popes. He is the moral theologian of the church. Sunday work. Disobeying parents, the children. Refusing an express order given by the parents in a serious matter, um, like being told not to go to certain places uh, or not hanging out with bad companions, that's, a, that's something serious. That's a direct order by your parents. Violating that is a grave sin. That's a mortal sin. Showing disrespect for parents by grave insult in their presence or doing anything else to offer them grave dishonor, even behind their back, grave dishonor, that's a grave sin. We have to honor our father and our mother. Scandal, inducing someone into sin. Provoking people to sin by immodest conversations, dress, jokes, flirting. It doesn't matter if your intention was good just to make a joke. If we induce someone to sin, that's on our conscience. Taking the Lord's name in front of others, especially in front of children. I want to read something about this, about taking the Lord's name. This is um, from the book by Father Gabriel Amorth, um, An Exorcist, More Stories. This is his second book. 
He says there, quote, The field of curses is vast and varied and forges true ties. We often discover these bonds when their origins are progressively revealed as we attempt to heal a victim of possession. A curse can also originate from such things as maledictions by a close relative, a habit of blaspheming, membership in the Freemasonry, spiritic and magic practices, and so on. Remedies include prayers, forgiveness, reparation, intercession. Close quote. Look what is in this group, huh? Membership in the Freemasonry, spiritic and magic practices, a habit of blaspheming. That's taking God's name in vain. Look where that ranks among being a Freemason, practicing magic. We're not talking about card tricks, okay, obviously. So this is where curses can come from. Quite a frightening reality when you consider how much experience that uh, that priest has had in this in this field of uh, dealing with the demonic. Okay, what other things? Parents. Let me read something from um, St. Alphonsus again. Parents sin gravely if, without some reasonable cause, they force their children into marriage, into the priesthood, or into the religious life. They would also sin if they unjustly kept their children from following the religious state if the children felt called to it. Close quote. Children, St. Alphonsus recommends that if you believe you have a religious vocation, now this is from a founder of a religious order, he says he recommends not telling anyone. You can tell your confessor, but don't tell anyone. You're not obliged to take advice from your parents in this matter, okay, regarding a religious vocation. St. Alphonsus, explained, he says this quite clearly, and he explains why. He says parents don't have a religious vocation. So it doesn't, you don't have to go to their, you know, for counsel with regards to that. But you should go to someone who does have a religious vocation, who knows and can see if there's a real vocation here or not, in order to get this. Remember St. John VNA? His father was a good father. You know, they gave, they gave food to the poor. They gave um, wood to the poor. In fact, St. John Vianney also often had to take a donkey load full of um, uh, wood to take it to the poor in, uh, in Dardilly. You know, to, uh, to, you know he, he was generous to the poor. He housed people who were, who were visiting, passing through. This is his father, St. John Vianney's father. He was generous to the poor. But what happened when St. John Vianney expressed the desire to go into the priesthood? His father wouldn't let him. He was a practicing Catholic. But that's gravely sinful to hold someone back from the priesthood. Now, in Providence, it worked out, obviously. But that doesn't mean that wasn't the right action of the Father. Okay. So just, it's, be, it's a religious vocation is a very personal thing. Just keep it between you and God and your confessor, or someone who is in the religious life who may be able to give counsel on that matter. Parents, have you failed to correct your children? Do you allow your teenagers to be alone with members of the opposite sex? Do you let children sleep in the same bed with you or let brothers and sisters sleep together? You have to avoid these things. Do you neglect to keep an eye on your children? Happy to let the neighbors or parish take up your responsibility while you enjoy your leisure. Remember, the children are your charges. God gave you the grace to raise those children You have the grace of state. The neighbors don't. Okay? You have the grace of state and you have the responsibility. Do you show favorites among your children? How many sins of envy are there? How many souls are damned because of serious envy? Because parents had shown favoritism. Kids see that. They're not blind. They see that. Husbands, are you failing in correcting and teaching the catechism yourself? Do you arrange for your children's sacraments? Do you do the arranging? Keep discipline in the family. The spiritual leader of the family is the father. Take that responsibility seriously. Be the man of the house. Take your responsibility seriously. Speaking ill of bishops and priests. Keep in mind that in reference to Saul, the evil king who was nonetheless chosen by God to be anointed temporal king, David said to the man who killed Saul, 
He said, Why didst thou not fear to put out thy hand to kill the Lord's anointed? I know there's a mess in the church, right? God's going to judge those bishops and priests. He doesn't need our voices to add to the judgment. huh? Just keep your mouths quiet. Don't raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. Now, David was upset because someone raised his hand against the Lord's anointed king. But that's just a temporal ruler. What about one anointed? A priest of God. Whom God chose to be a bishop or priest. Husbands and wives, have you fulfilled your obligation regarding marital duty? Keep it in mind that no reasonable request for the marital duty may be denied. If a reasonable request is denied, it's a mortal sin. A reasonable request denied a mortal sin. And if it foreseeably causes the other spouse to fall into grave sin, it's a second mortal sin, scandal, because you led someone else into sin, because you denied a reasonable request. In fact, St. Alphonsus points out, quote, many a woman damns herself and her husband because of failure in this matter, close quote. And this is from a bishop who's heard an awful lot of confessions, and he's the moral doctor of the church. This is what you vowed before God, to be an image of Christ and the church, Okay. This is what you vow to do on your wedding day. It doesn't matter. The individual person doesn't matter. I don't care if you don't like your spouse, all right? I mean, we get to know people and we think, well, I don't really like that about that person. Don't worry about it. You vowed to God. You vowed to God to be an image of Christ and the church. Live that vow. Live out that image. Now, how many parents would keep a loaded 357 with a bullet in the chamber lying in the living room, unsupervised, where the children play? How many parents would leave an open bottle of rat poison in the middle of the living room, unsupervised, where the children are playing? Or worse yet, mix in the rat poison with the vitamins and let the children pick out what's going to be good for them from among the rat poison. How many of us would do that? Now, considering the obvious answers to those questions, how many parents have Internet access where their children can get to it? How many parents let their children surf the net and pick out the websites they want to go to from among the bad sites? Like the vitamins from among the rat poison. How many parents let their children use the Internet unsupervised? The children would have better odds with the rat poison than using this Internet unsupervised. Parents, have you ever had a moment of weakness? Do you think your children are impervious to weakness? What if that moment of weakness happens... When the junk is just a click away and you're not in the house or you're just in the other room. The average age of the first exposure to this junk is 11 years old. That's the average age of the first exposure to this junk that's out there. You know a router actually makes a pretty good target for 30 odd six. An internet router. Do you need that thing in your house? Next time you're out shooting uh, some clay pigeons, take a few more things out there and toss those up and see how they explode. Okay. You don't need that stuff in your house, huh? You don't need an open toilet bowl in your living room, huh? Parents, How many of you ask your children, even your little ones, what they think about when they're alone? Keep in mind, the devil is always out there trying to put ideas. There's a very famous image of St. Michael where he is casting the devil down into hell by means of this light which is coming from his head. It's basically he's got this helmet on and there's a light coming down and that's what's pushing the devil down into hell. Because the battle in heaven was a battle of ideas, of the intellects. And it was the idea, who is like God, that drove the devil out. No one is like God. That's what drove the devil out. So it's a battle of ideas, and their tactics have not changed. Your children are going to be subject to different ideas. All kinds of ideas will come into the children's head. Some of them, they may think, "That's what is that? Where did that come from? And they may not do it. 
Okay? But you may ask your children. Has any, I mean, you don't want to scandalize them. Don't lead them into ideas. Okay? Don't do that. But you ask them, is there ever, ever any weird thoughts come into your head? That, you know? And if they say, well, you know, I was afraid to ask, but something did, you know. And then you, you can say, no, don't do that. That's not a good thing to do. Okay? Keep good custody of that garden of your children's souls. The other thing, how many of us would we sit down and say, can you imagine this scenario? If we just walk up to anyone, especially people we haven't met, and we just say, hi, my name is so-and-so. My favorite color is this. My favorite music group is this. I like camping. I like hunting. I like fishing. I especially like hanging out with my friend so-and-so. You know, you would think, okay, when is this person going to get off of himself? huh? And then you're willing to do that to anyone who comes to you, huh? Now, we call that something, huh? We call that vanity. All right? Someone's absorbed in himself. Now, how many Facebook pages are like that? My name is so-and-so. My favorite color is this. My favorite band is this. My favorite movies are this. That kind of thing, presenting oneself like that, that's actually sin against modesty. Now, modesty comes from, it's, it's not just clothing. It is involved in that. But it, it, modesty has to do with observing the due mode of behavior. That's where modesty comes from, observing a fitting mode of action. It's not fitting if someone were to just come up to you and say, you know, complete stranger, hi, my name is so-and-so. I like camping. I like fishing. My color is this. And you're not, you know, you don't care about the other person. You're just talking about yourself. We'd say, all right, when is this guy going to stop, you know? What are we doing on the Internet with that kind of stuff? We're just putting it out there to anyone who wants to hear it, to the world. Let the world know me. I want to be known by the world. Here it is. Here I am. Look at me. Look at my life. Okay. What about sins of omission? A lot of sins of omission out there. How many inspirations have we received that we've neglected? Many, many inspirations. St. Gregory relates of a uh, a rich man who basically wasted his time. He'd led a wicked life. And then at his death, he saw these devils coming to carry him off. He said, give me some time. Give me some time. Till tomorrow. And the devil said, oh, fool. Do you now seek time? You've had so much time. But you've wasted it. Spent it committing sin. And now you seek for time. Time is no more for you. Well, the unhappy man continued to cry out, call for his assistance. He actually had a son who was a monk who was present there. Uh, Maximus was the name of his son. And he started crying out, and he said, So help me, Maximus, help me, Maximus. And um, just right in front of Maximus' eyes, he saw his face on fire. He started being thrashing about the bed from side to side and screaming. And that's how he ended. Are we neglecting? Are we wasting our time? That was a man who had neglected his time, wasted his time. And he had a son who was a monk. So that was not a salvation for him. He wasted his time. How many miserable souls, say St. Alphonsus, that practiced mental prayer, frequented Holy Communion, that might have been called saints by putting themselves in a near occasion, ended up by being damned, the prey of hell. In fact, he relates where there was this holy woman who would actually bury the martyrs, okay? And one man who had been left for dead, they thought he was martyred, she went to go bury his body. She saw he was alive. She brought him home, tried to nurse him back to health, and he recovered. But the problem was, By the proximate occasion of sin, the two fell into sin. They were virtuous. He was a martyr. He was going to be a martyr. She was burying the martyrs. But just by having too much company together, too much familiarity together, someone who wasn't his wife, They ended up by falling into sin. They lost the grace of God and they ended up losing the faith. They actually fell away from the faith. Don't 
let anything get between you and God. In London, in 1847, there was a young widow in her late 20s. She found herself in an illicit relationship with a young lord. The lord, of course, it's not, we're speaking of, uh, those are titles of, in, in London. They're, in England, they have these, uh, these titles of nobility. So she was in this illicit relationship. Well, late one night as she was falling asleep, a glimmer of light started to glow and expand at her door. To her astonishment, the door slowly started to open. And she saw the Lord, the young Lord, come in. Not our, our blessed Lord. This, this man with whom she had been sinning. He approached her. He grabbed her left wrist. And he hissed, There is a hell. And her wrists were burned down to the bone. She carried that scar the rest of her life right down to the bone. She found out that that man had just the night before been found drunk and died in the servant's arms. He came to her to tell her and burn the memory into her very body that there is a hell. She also could see the footsteps. They were burned into the floor where he came into the room and departed. None of us want to go there, huh? None of us want to go there, but are we going to take the resolve to become saints? Our Lord told Mother Maria Perina, he told her, This is the woman who promoted the holy face devotion. He says, This scapular with a holy face medal is an armor of defense, a shield of strength, which Jesus wishes to give the world in these times of lust and hatred against God and his church. Keep in mind, this is 1938. These times of lust and hatred against the church. Diabolical nets are thrown to wrench the faith from hearts. Evils abound. True apostles are few. And the remedy is the holy face. Jesus. He went on. He said, so many sacrilegious communions, but still more communions without love and therefore without fruit. Our Lord appeared all bloody and he said, see how I suffer. What ingratitude on the part of those that say they love me. Ingratitude. Our Lord seeks the prayers and sacrifices of those in the state of grace. And that's what we're getting around to here. We've been given a lot. Are we maintaining that state of grace? Are we making prayers and sacrifices to get other people into the state of grace? Our Lord once said to St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, he said to her, See, Magdalene, how Christians are in the hands of the devil. Unless my elect by their prayers deliver them, they shall be devoured. So, what are we going to do about all this? We need to make the resolve. St. Alphonsus says there are two things that make a saint. Having the desire to do it and having the resolution, the resolve to carry it out. Come to confession. You'll find God's mercy there. Come to confession. St. Augustine says there are many who repent, but still have a lingering desire for that sin. They still hold on to something something they like about it. Well, look, Judas did that. He repented. He even made restitution, if you could call it that. He threw the 30 pieces of silver back. He even confessed to the high priest, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. Public confession. He was sorry, but he didn't have the penitence to turn his life around. The humility to ask forgiveness of God in confession by confessing to Almighty God. And he wasn't willing to amend his life. Otherwise, he would have. Look, we are in a battle for our souls. Grace cannot be hindered except by us. Don't underestimate the power of grace to the soul that's willing God will make sure that person gets saved. There's a priest who came to someone's deathbed. He arrived 
And the person, um, they said, uh, Father, he's already in a coma. He's on his way out. It's probably going to be a matter of minutes here. He's in a coma. He's on his way out. So the priest said, okay, I'll go in and see him. He goes in there, and the man's awake. He says, oh, Father, I'm glad you're here. Can you hear my confession? Certainly. Heard his confession. Gave him the last sacraments. The man was very much at peace. And then he finished his conversation. The priest said, all right, well, I'll go back outside. He went outside and he says, I thought you said he was in a coma. I'm like, yeah, he's in a coma. He went back in there and the man was in the coma. See, that man had goodwill. And even in the impossible situation of being in a coma, God made sure that he saw the priest because he had goodwill. Not like the other man who was a habitual sinner, huh? And who saw the priest still. But this man had goodwill. He really wanted to do everything to amend his life. Now is the time to repent. How many inspirations have we neglected? How many things we have not taken advantage of? Graces we have here. Adoration. The liturgy here. How many graces have we neglected here? Now is the time. Because remember... Whomsoever much has been given, much will be required. We may not get a letter from beyond the grave saying, no one would even do this for me, personally addressed to us. We may not get someone come from beyond the grave to burn the memory of the reality of hell into our wrist. Let this be your wake-up call. Now is the time to repent. Come to confession. You'll find God's mercy there. You'll find God's mercy. It gives priests great joy when great sinners come to repent in the sacrament of confession. We're not going to chew you out, okay? Convert. Now is the time to do it. You won't scandalize the priest, okay? You're not going to scandalize the priest. We all have weaknesses. We just have to admit them and turn away. Come to confession. Let this be your wake-up call. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.